The season of Advent is a time of anticipation. In the momentous conversation between Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama that resulted in the publication of the Book of Joy, one of the pillars of joy that they identified was perspective. Opening ourselves to a different perspective can bring a sense of hope in the midst of despair, allowing joy to creep in no matter what. Opening to the perspectives of others can shift our fear to compassion, turning swords into plows. Salvation is near, says the, the scripture, and when we wake up, when we prepare room in our lives for the new light, new insight, new hope to enter. Let us hear from the prophet Isaiah. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of mighty nations. Then they will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light. And a reading from the letter to Romans. Make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-by-day -day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work that God began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. Must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and, and indulgence, and sleeping around in dissipation, in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it's not a Christmas song, but the song that actually inspired me for this series was not actually Joy to the World, but rather This Little Light of Mine. It's a gospel song that became an anthem of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. It was not, as some have suggested, a spiritual song on plantations during slavery. Instead, it was a children's song written in the 1920s, reminding us that there is a light that each of us has been given, and when we let that light shine through us, there is a greater light at work in this world. You know, I think the version of the song that I like best is, is the one that was sung by the queen of American folk music, uh, Odetta Holmes, and the Harlem Boys Choir in the David Letterman show on September 19, 2001.
Well, doesn't that just make you want to clap and sing? Doesn't it? But do you remember what was happening at that time? I mean, the Twin Towers had just fallen. Something none of us had ever considered possible. Air travel was halted for days. We were terrified. I mean, parents rushed to school to get, to get their children. And I remember when I went to church that evening, our, our sanctuary was filled. Sanctuaries across the country were filled. And, and that night, and that weekend, and weekends that followed, they were filled with people who were frightened and confused. And even the David, Letter, uh, David Letterman show suspended its show because we felt that it was wrong for us to laugh. And so it was darkness. And then a group of boys stood up to sing a prophetic hymn. Hope and joy shone through. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. In the midst of darkness, the light prevailed. The light wins. No matter how dark it gets, the light will not be extinguished. The light wins, and in these moments, hopeful joy is found. I mean, that's what the prophet Isaiah was saying in Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now they couldn't see that light yet, but Isaiah's hope was that they would. You see, it was the 8th century B.C., and the southern kingdom of Judah was in turmoil. People were frightened and terrified, anxious. The northern kingdom of Israel had, had been defeated as the Assyrian Empire expanded its territory and moved down, coming ever closer to Jerusalem. A succession of kings had struggled to preserve and secure Judah's existence. But Isaiah proclaimed a political solution was not the answer. It was a dark night. But Isaiah announced that God would bring forth a new king who would rule the people with justice and kindness. A light was about to break forth over the horizon. Can you see it? Are you prepared for it? Will you welcome that light? But they couldn't, or they wouldn't. And so that light would not break forth into the world for another 800 years. And when it did, Jesus proclaimed, You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. You see, what he had in mind was a lamp like this. Oh, so fragile. But with a light so strong that if you put it on a lampstand, it would illumine the entire house. And can you just imagine if everyone did this? If everyone let this light shine? I mean, Jesus was saying, no matter how dark it gets, light will prevail. The light is waiting to break through. You see, folks, it's not the circumstances of our lives that can get the best of us. It's us. Thinking that we can't, or we won't, or, or we shouldn't, or we're not good enough to shine. It's this judgment that we place upon ourselves and on others that others can beat us down and keep that light hidden, darkening our lives. Like putting a bushel basket over that light. You see, there is shame that we pass amongst us. You will never measure up. Or you have never measured up. Or we say to ourselves, I can't or I won't. I can't do that. I'm not good enough. God can't use me. Friends, what is 
isn't that's keeping your light hidden. Imagine if Mary and Joseph had a, had let shame get the better, better of them. There would be no Christmas, would there? You know, in the first chapter of the story, Matthew introduces us to Joseph. And the story begins. Joseph is saying, this is not how it's supposed to be. I mean, Joseph had honored the tradition, traditional betrothal, uh, betrothal period, rather, so that he could marry Mary. As a carpenter, he had always had this attention to detail. You know, measure twice, cut once. I mean, he honored the traditions of the time, and he waited for this arranged marriage. But now this arranged marriage had taken a wrong turn, and he, it was headed for disaster. His fiancée was pregnant, and he knew it wasn't him. I mean, this is not how life was supposed to be. But what did he do to deserve this? I mean, have you ever been in that place? And Mary was facing her own struggle, wasn't she? I mean, pregnant by the Holy Spirit? Who in the world was going to believe that? Maybe that's why she left town to spend her pregnancy with her relative Elizabeth. A pregnant, unwed teenager in an impoverished community? What future did she have? I mean, what future would she have in those circumstances if they were the same today? Shame on her. Shame. Shame. She was doomed. Can an unwed, pregnant teenager possibly be the mother of the Prince of Peace? Or is her future lost and she will never amount to anything? Which is it? What's the song tell us? Hide it under a bushel? No! I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. The darkness is not going to prevail. Because the light wins. You see, the very thing that can be the source of shame to cover the light can be used by God to uncover. You know, when I was just coming back to church, after my 30-year absence, I was invited to go on an Emmaus retreat. Have, ever, have you ever been on an Emmaus retreat? Have any of you ever been on one? Or, or a Casillo event? Or, it's this three-day uh, retreat based on Luke 24 story, The Road to Emmaus. It's this wonderful spiritual retreat meant to encourage Christians to find ways to live out their individual calls to discipleship in their home, in their church, and in their communities. Now, since that initial Emmaus walk, I have participated and led many retreats, and I, I would recommend that everyone here should at least try one once. But, but on that first one, I was quite overwhelmed. I was a brand new Christian. I had no idea what I had gotten myself into. And on that last day of my retreat, I, it was custom that everyone who participated would actually stand up and come up center stage and, and speak about what that weekend meant to them. And folks, I thought I was going to be sick. I was terrified. Because I was not a public speaker, and I felt like I was back in my high school speech class being called upon to do an extemporaneous speech. You know those kind where there are no preparation or, or research done, where, where we would be just given this topic, and we'd have this five-minute speech on whatever topic we drew out of the hat? And so I waited. And I waited and waited, and as each person got up and so eloquently shared what this weekend retreat had meant to them and how it had changed their lives for the better, and then it was my turn, the very last one. And I was so scared, friends, I, that all my table mates uh, at, the, at the retreat encouraged me by holding my hand and walking me up and standing up. Uh, by the podium with me, and, and as I looked out over the crowd of people,
people that were out there who came specifically that day to hear how this weekend had changed my life. And, and I opened my mouth. And, and I was trying to say something, anything, uh, that would be sufficient so I wouldn't look like a fool. And suddenly, as I opened my mouth, a large bell that was sitting outside this chapel that we were in on a big stand, the bell rang. And it rang one time. Just one. Letting us know that it was time for lunch. And I have to say, I've never forgotten what I said that day. I paused, I took a breath, and without really thinking, I said and uttered these words, saved by the bell. And the crowd laughed. I mean, every person in the room began to laugh and clap. And for a moment, I thought I was okay. I did great. I just won the approval of the entire room. But as I walked back to my seat, and as I took my seat in the back row, I was crushed. I was embarrassed. And I realized that everyone in the room was not laughing with me, but they were laughing at me. Because they knew that that was a speech worthy of an F. And I wore that F, my friends, for a very, very long time. Years, actually. And it honestly kept me from being a pastor for many years. And I mean, Lord, what are you doing ever considering a career in ministry? You can't even put together a five-minute speech that is worthy of anything but an F. You can't do it. You will never be able to do it. But look at me now. You see, the very thing that can be the source of shame to cover the light can be used by God to uncover the light. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife. You know, the most mentioned command in the Bible is do not be afraid. Because we're more than a list of faults and mistakes and missed opportunities. You see, the light is waiting to break through. The light could shine through you. You know, when we look up at the night sky, we see that the night is filled with stars. But someone looked up at that night sky and saw something more than stars and connected the dots to make the Big Dipper. Have you seen it? And I wonder if we could take those dots of our own lives and call that big glory, that very thing that is the source of shame that covers your light can be used by God to uncover the light. Jesus said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, as I mentioned earlier, that since that initial retreat, I had participated in several Emmaus walks. Sometimes I was a table leader. Other times I led the music, and I gave various talks, and I worked behind the scenes on, on the Agape team, making sure that everyone was treated hospitably. And last year, as I was walking in Target at, in Alexandria, of all places, someone came up to me and said, I just wanted to thank you for what you did for me eight years ago. She said, you were the music leader on my Emmaus walk, and I just wanted to let you know that since that weekend, you have inspired me to lead the music at five different retreats. Since then, I started a music group at my own church. And you know, friends, I had no recollection of her. It was possible 
that that moment, I had the most impact on a person's life, and I had no idea. I didn't remember. Friends, let your light shine. Someone is waiting for that light to break through. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. You see, God is ready. God is like the electricity that's seeking a lamp. You have been given the power to change someone's life for the better with, with something that you say or something that you do, uh, and you may not even remember it. You may not ever live long enough to see the impact of how you have been a part of a story that is bigger than yourselves. To give someone else hope and joy. But God is ready. Do not be afraid. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let's pray. God, how grateful we are. As we stand at the beginning of this new season of the year, knowing that you loved us 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, you sent your Son for us so that through us, your light might shine. Give us the courage that we need to be the hope and the joy and the light for someone else who is just waiting for that hope to light and break through into our lives. May you be the light in us and through us. In Jesus' name.